Professor Evans, Honorable Justice Mr. Chandraju, His Excellency Hugo Estuto, a Joint Secretary from Ministry of Women and Child, Mr. Ashish Shirvasta, distinguished guests, special invitees, and friends. I feel so tongue-tied and need, needless to say extremely nervous sitting next to these distinguished guests. I am tremendously honored at the opportunity of moderating such an illustrious panel and feel grateful to you all for accepting the invite to participate in a panel discussion on He for She, the role of men in women empowerment. Professor Mary Evans is an Emeritus Leverhulme Professor at the London School of Economics and Professor Emeritus at the University of Kent the author of various studies on feminism. Mr. Justice Dhananjay Yashwant Chandrachur currently is an honorable judge of the Supreme Court of India and requires no introduction. He is famous for the landmark judgments he has authored, including the one day before yesterday, which I would like to mention is that the bench headed by Mr. Justice Chandrachur upheld the decision of High Court to grant short service commission women officers permanent commission in the army, thereby setting up yet another example of gender equality. <laughs> His Excellency Hugo Estuto is ambassador of European Union to India and Bhutan since October 2019 and belongs to Italian diplomatic service. His career spans experience not only in Europe, but also Nairobi and Asia since 2001 when he joined the service. <coughs> Mr. Ashi Shrivastha is the Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Women and Child and spearheads many, campaign, spearheads many schemes for the benefit of women of India. The topic for this distinguished panel, he for she, the role of men in women empowerment and gender equality is inspired by a powerful project started by UN Women called He for She in the year 2014. This global movement calls upon men and people of all genders to not just be part of the gender equality conversation, but also become active participants in creating solutions. I quote from their official website, the world is at a turning point. Many people everywhere understand and support the idea of gender equality. They know it's not just a woman's issue, it's a human rights issue. He or she is an invitation for men and people of all genders to stand in solidarity with women to create a bold, visible, and united force for gender equality. The men of he or she aren't on the sidelines. They are working with women and with each other to build businesses, raise families, and give back to their communities. The role of a socially aware man with a gender neutral approach is vital in promoting gender sensitization. Be it the supportive father who nurtures the ambitions of his daughter, the life partner who is keen and proud to be the man behind a successful woman, or the male colleagues who respect and promote the contribution of their female counterparts. Today, we probe the ways in which the role of a man in gender sensitization can be enhanced and capitalized, made part of the cultural legacy for future generations. Coming to Indian context specifically, I think he or she can be extremely significant in changing mindset. Against this backdrop, I solicit your esteemed opinion by inviting you to share your valuable personal insight, observations, and of course, your considered view on role that men can play in women empowerment. 
We can follow that with questions from fellow panelists and myself to keep the conversation lively and on topic. Whom should we be inviting to speak first? I'm asking the audience, whom would you like to hear first? Professor Mary Evans? Yeah, Professor Mary Evans. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you. Um, that's a very, very kind invitation. And Just in request the mic. mic. All of you, we can't really hear Somebody it can fix the mic, please. Thank you very much for that very kind invitation. It wasn't quite what I was expecting, but nevertheless, I'm very happy to make some initial remarks. Um, may I also thank uh, the organizers of this um, event um, for bringing us all together this afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a great pleasure to be amongst so many people sharing the same concerns. So my thanks, first of all, on that issue. I want to be brief. I want to say three things about the ways in which I think there can be support from male colleagues, male friends, male relatives for the issues that face women. First of all, I think but the first two issues are in point of fact somewhat theoretical ones. First of all, I think men have to acknowledge it isn't just a case of empowering women, that women are already empowered. And I think that that is a fundamental point <laughs> that has to be made. There was a feminist slogan in the 1970s, much printed on postcards, which read, women hold up half the sky. And I think that that slogan is one which is perhaps worth remembering. That it isn't just a matter of putting women into leadership roles, however much we might desire that, but it's also a matter of putting into the public space the recognition of the part that women already play in maintaining the fabric of our social existence. So that's the first point that I want to make, and to make emphatically. The second thing that I want to do is for men to turn their backs on and to express their criticism of, their skepticism about, naturalizing ideas about what men and women can do. Let me assure everybody in this audience that men can pour the tea and men can change the nappies. There is no reason why the function of care, a fundamental ingredient of, of the maintenance of all our lives, is something that should be assumed to, to be a matter that is only possible for being performed by women. I want to make care a human capacity. That's the second thing about which I am positively <coughs> passionate. Care has to be shared by women and men. It has to be acknowledged that there is no natural reason why women should be the carers of the world in which we live. And thinking about that has huge implications for the ways in which we can then think about what it is possible for women to do. So, so those are the first two things which I want to identify as absolutely fundamental for men to acknowledge, for men to think about, for men to consider, and for men and women to take on board as shared commitments to the ways in which we think about our humanity and our human existence. The final thing that I want to say, the third point that I want to make, is about the nature of the social and the public space. This is both theoretical and practical. And I want there to be much more emphasis on the making of the public space of the urban worlds in which we all live, the spaces in which women can be as comfortable, as free from attack, discrimination of various kinds, as many men are. I don't think that it is reasonable to suppose that in the 21st century, cities should be gendered spaces. I think the public space in which we all live should be space which is shared by us all. That has profound practical implications as well as the ways in which we think about those spaces in which we live. 
So I want to be able to walk outside this building in exactly the same way as a man might. I want to be able to walk the streets in the evening without fear that these are dangerous places. I want the public world to be quite literally a shared world. So these are the things which I want to say, three things which I hope it will be things which I hope will be issues that we can think about this afternoon. Thank you very much for asking me to speak. Actually, I have come here to learn more, and it was so nice to listen to you, ma'am. All the three points are so hard, and uh, they actually summarize the entire, they comprehend the entire matter in a very good way. Uh, uh, this issue is very big, and uh, there's a lot to internalize than to speak. <laughs> Externalize properly. Probably, yeah, there's a lot to do. Uh, at the outset, I would only want to say that uh, uh, we have to be careful while uh, doing all the things. Uh, you know, he for she, it can mean the he has traditionally been meant to be understood as the humanity. It's, the, it's, uh, it's been expressed as, you know, the humanity, the mankind, why not the womankind? <laughs> So, uh, the entire mankind could be expressed in the female, in the feminine gender also. And uh, so, he for she could, uh, in one way, be understood to mean all of us going together, being together, to be equal and to be, uh, to be able to enjoy equal rights, equal opportunities, equal rewards and equal resources. That could be one part of it. And, uh, but while, you know, coming to the more uh, uh, popular or traditional understanding of the world, of the word he, uh, we have to remember that while we must do what we, we should be doing, uh, we must not underestimate the agency of women or do anything which uh, tends to uh, end up being patronizing or you know something like that so uh, that's where I would like to put a comma right now and give it to Mr. Thank you thank, thank you very much thank you, thank you for inviting me it's a great pleasure to be here with you all uh, what I can give you is, is a perspective from, from the European <coughs> Union I guess what, what, what the, I should start by saying that actually gender equality is a, is a basic priority for the European Union domestically and when it comes to its um, external projection. And I'm happy to say that the, the new president of the European Commission, uh, Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, uh, has made this very clear since, since the very start of her mandate in, in December. And actually the Commission is about to adopt a new gender equality strategy for 2020-2024 ahead um, of the International Women's Day uh, in, in March. Um, it, it's a fact that there is a lot to be done. Uh, it, it's the same, I'm afraid, all around the world. Um, uh, the numbers confirm that the unequal balance uh, between women and men still persists. It persists um, in terms of political representation in parliaments all around the world. In terms of salary level, uh, we, we have not yet achieved an equal pay men and women for the same job. In, in more general terms, in the fabric, all, all, all through the fabric of society. And this is an unacceptable state of affairs. Um, uh, we, we, we need to invest in uh, women's empowerment. It's a matter of justice, it's a matter of fairness, but if I, if I may say so, uh, it also makes business sense. In, in the sense that it's now um, graphically evident, but it has been made graphically evident in a number of studies that the empowerment of women uh, is, 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 the, is necessary if you want to achieve um, uh, economic development. And actually, even the, the very achievement of sustainable development goals largely depends on the, on the degree um, uh, of our success in, in empowering women, um, taking the, the full space in society and in economic life. 
Um, 2020 is a, is a good year, I think, to, 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 to mark a step change. And since um, uh, it, we have a number of anniversaries, including the 25 years since Beijing, and, and the 10th anniversary of young women. And as a report by UN Secretary General, I, I understand, prepared on this occasion, um, does allow us to take stock of, of the state of affairs of today. And the report is very clear uh, in saying that we need to accelerate action. Um, we, we, we must uh, take action now if you want to see gender equality achieved in this generation. And I think it's incumbent on us to, to do so. And, uh, and when I say incumbent on us, clearly I mean all of us, um, uh, women and men. Uh, it's necessary that men feel equally um, the, 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 the need um, to, 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 to take action uh, when it comes to women's empowerment. It's necessary to fully engage men and, and boys alike. Obviously, if you want to fight and redress gender stereotypes, it's something we need to do um, uh, at a very early stage in life before these stereotypes get crystallized. So it's the utmost importance to engage, to engage with men, to engage with boys, uh, it's brothers, fathers, teachers, community leaders, <coughs> and we, we all need to, to contribute towards this aim. Um, it, it's true in a general way, it's true in more specific and more and even more tragic um, uh, aspects of gender discrimination that we, we need to fight violence against women, obviously, and, and there men have a specific uh, role to play. Um, uh, we need to, but in more general terms, we need to contribute, encourage, and, and promote um, uh, gender empowerment, uh, starting with female uh, participation in, 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 in professional life. And this also means, obviously, that the society needs to organize in terms of flexible working arrangements, parental leave provisions. Um, the issue of care, which was mentioned there, is, is something which has to be um, uh, addressed uh, with individual behaviors, but also in terms of uh, legislation and, 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 and societal behaviors. So in, in, in short, and I conclude with that, I guess we need indeed a collective effort for changing the mindsets. And achieving gender equality is a responsibility of all of us, not just women, but uh, men, women, and society overall. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, um, let me begin by uh, expressing our reservation about the, the whole notion of he for she. Because to my mind, uh, the topic he for she uh, can be limiting in its nature. Uh, because the battle, the battle for equality is not of one mainstream gender for another. It is a battle for equality of every individual. And it's a battle which is waged every single day for every individual in society. So he for she should not be understood as a limiting expression uh, by which we define the quest for women's equality in terms of the man's perspective on the quest for women's equality. That's the first thing that I want to uh, emphasize. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that the dominant discourse today presents the fight for gender equality as something which is beneficial for men, and that is the threat, which is the second point which I, uh, which I want to mention, emphasize, leading up from the first point. The fight for gender equality then stems from the responsibility of men, responsibility arising from the fact that men have been the beneficiaries of privilege across generations, across society, both in formal and institutional structures and institutions. The third is I think when you speak about he for she, the battle is as much about changing mindsets as a process which is intrinsic to uh, the alteration of feudal and patriarchal structures, particularly in the context of a society uh, such as ours. Because the object of a movement like this is essentially to change mindsets, mindsets across the spectrum, 
uh, mind uh, mind uh, their mindsets not only of men but mindsets of women as well because subjugation as a result of uh, the prevalence, the domination of social structures, the patriarchal structures, uh, the feudal structures in much of rural India leads to a situation where women are by the very nature of their birth uh, <coughs> taught to believe in an ideology of being dominated and I think changing mindsets of men and changing mindsets of women is the key to the movement. And uh, uh, finally, I just want to just uh, mention this, that India has slipped to the 112th position from the 108th in 2018 in the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index of 2020, which covered 153 economies. Among the 153 countries which were studied, India is the only country where the economic gender gap is larger than the political gender gap. Only one quarter of women, compared with 82% of men, engage actively in the labor market, that is people who are working or looking for work. One of the lowest participation rates in the world, and that makes us 145th. India ranks the low 150th on the health and survival sub-index, 94.4 as a result of the skewed sex ratio at birth, there are only 91 girls born for every 100 boys uh, born, a ratio which is well below the natural one. And we must put this in the context of the South Asian region. Uh, the region is home to 860 million women, three-fourths of whom live in India. So when you put India in the perspective, not merely of uh, the, the world index, but particularly in the context of the South Asian region, which is closing on uh, the gender gap, uh, a lot really needs to be done. I think the significance of the he for she movement is its emphasis on the mind as much as on the dismantling of uh, patriarchal legal and social structures. Uh to a set of questions which I was already carrying in my mind to ask, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Evans, because she has authored several papers on feminism. Uh, so, you know, there is academically the phrase has met with criticism and has been accused of the inherent patriarchal bias which resonates in well saying he or she, sounding a bit patronizing towards women. How much do you believe in he or she? I mean, we do not doubt the intent and we do not doubt the kind of uh, sensitization drive that it has created, the campaign, the kind of impact the campaign has made. But do you feel that it could have been, <coughs> the, it could have been phrased better or, you know, uh, nonetheless, we all acknowledge the fact that it has created a lot of stir, it has impacted, it has created very positive impact, brought in a lot of men into its fold as champions and you know, a lot of people around the world have endorsed the campaign and stand for the campaign, yet do you think academically it could have been phrased better? Um, I'm not sure. I think what's going on is something where I think what he or she does is to point out, as other speakers on this panel today have pointed out, the, the extent to which men have occupied a privileged position across the globe. It's not about one, one country, it's, it's multicultural. And so obviously there's a sense in which there's a there's tremendous pressure to try and bring women up to the place that men occupy. That kind of equalizing um, pressure is a very powerful one. The problem is, I think, although I fully support the idea that you have to change human mindsets and not just the mindsets of, of men, you have to change the mindsets across the gender divide, across the binary divide, that's extremely important. At the same time, there are always problems in thinking about human rights because there are certain situations in which there are specific, there are specific instances where being female carries with it very particular disadvantages. So there's a paradox here, I think there's a very complicated paradox 
of those saying, yes, we want to advance the position, the gender neutrality of the human subject. And that's something which has been discussed across the people speaking this afternoon. But at the same time, we also have to hold on to those the positions of disadvantage which women may occupy which are different and distinct from those of men. So it's both moving forward in one way, which I think is, or thinking in one way, which I think is a very powerful and a very important one, but it's also remembering that it's not, ju it's not possible just to move on without altering some of those gender different differences of differ disadvantage which persist and exist. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, at this juncture, I would like to ask <coughs> the Joint Secretary, Mr. Rashid Shirvastar. Uh, you know, the patriarchy is so inherent in us. The centuries old baggage which we are carrying in our minds, the mindsets, you know, uh, especially in India, Many times we would agree that it's not men, but it is women who also gaze women with this so-called male gaze, the stereotypes which are being created, and the way we evaluate how women dress up or you know their, the expectations of the social conduct, everything is so male-centric. We are so used to be viewing ourselves from a male point of view that I have I'll be surprised if five women from this room can <coughs> honestly admit to not looking at themselves from that particular perspective while leaving for work. <coughs> am I dressed appropriately for work? Uh, am I supposed to wear trousers to work? Or am I supposed to wear a jacket on top of this? And I don't think men in that sense think, apply that much of uh, consideration to the fact that how they are going to dress up to the workplace or uh, what appropriate, uh, how appropriate can I look if I go to this uh, party or to this dinner or to this club or to this just about any place. I, my question to you is that how the government schemes can help change this attitude and this mindset. We know the government <coughs> will, will, is in place. Prime Minister of India has already said, Beti, Bachao, Beti Padao. Save the girl, save the, uh, uh, educate the daughter. Save the girl, educate the daughter, educate the girl. But how are we, how are we in our, through our schemes, how are we going to bring about this change, which is, which is from the, it is like teaching somebody, say, from alphabet A. Vinita, you've answered the question in a good part yourself. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah, change, uh, especially on uh, social and mind spaces, is, is a gradual uh, movement normally. It's up to us to see how we can accelerate uh, the entire, uh, the, how can we, how we can increase the momentum of uh, the entire, the, uh, how, how we can increase the momentum. So what the government is doing about it? First of all, this is true that uh, um, mindset, as uh, Honorable Justice uh, Jasrachur Chur very rightly pointed out, is one of the very fundamental uh, areas to be touched and to be handled, tackled, and uh, transformed. So we uh, were contemplating on uh, you know, I was, uh, I joined the ministry about one and a half year ago, and one of the very, very important things which I realized, not immediately after joining, because this was one thing which I had been and all of us observed through the life. So, uh, transforming mindsets, a mindset change campaign, you know, those kinds of things really need to be taken up. But does the government do that? And if the government do the, uh, does that, how the government does it, to what extent, to what depth, to what breadth, and uh, so all those kinds of things were there. As far as schemes and programs are there, uh, number one, uh, there you rightly said there's the Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao, which is uh, save the daughter, educate the daughter, and Honorable Prime Minister 
you know, exp expanded uh, the uh, understanding and the domain of uh, the slogan to Beti Barhao, which has also helped the daughter grow and you know, expand her scopes uh, a flourish. So uh, that is one thing. Uh, the government uh, across, now gender is not uh, a, a very tight vertical. Actually, it's, it's spread across, you know, it is cross-sectional, it intersects and cross, it, it, uh, it pervades all across all ministries, all domains of <coughs> intervention and work of the government. So uh, one of the ways in which government does look at it is uh, by way of doing a gender budgeting analysis in which uh, in terms of financial allocation of resources, how much on every initiative intervention scheme program of the government is really going on gender identified outputs and outcomes. Uh, so there, there are a good number of things about women's safety, about cultural and social norms. Why should my daughter, my wife, my sister, my mother, they have to, or you know, any of the women I know or I'm seeing right now, or why should any of the men have to think what they are going to wear when they are going to go out? They should feel happy wearing, wearing that. Now, uh, if they are happy, confident, and you know, feeling good about it, then it's acceptance in a certain kind of a social setup would be, uh, yes, to a certain extent relevant. If one is going to office, one needs to be dressed in a certain way. If one is appearing in sales court, one has to be very absolutely properly formal. <laughs> sir, sir, with your kind permission. <laughs> and so, but, you know, in general social spaces, how my daughter goes, dresses, you know, that's, that should be totally up to her. If she's walking from a metro station to her house and the lane is partially lit and partially not lit, and if there's a car crossing by, and if there's a boy who's, you know, just trying to ogle at her and making her feel uncomfortable without doing anything more for the time being, then that is also, you know, it's seriously offensive. When I hear my daughter saying this to me, I feel absolutely, and I'm sure any of us would. So, uh, so the issue is about changing mindsets, changing behavioral patterns, and, uh, you know, extending to the best extent possible uh, behavior change initiatives and mindset change initiatives. With the Beti Bachao, Beti Parhao scheme, we do, try, we, do, uh, we do try to do this in a very decentralized manner. The government uh, devolves funds to districts for behavior change communication purposes. That's one thing. And uh, the initiatives are, you know, of course, they are legal, uh, uh, they are legal frameworks and legal and administrative and legal tools available. For example, there's the Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace, BPR Act 2013, there's the Domestic Violence Act, there's the Prohibition of Child Marriage Act, there have been criminal law amendments, very strong in 2013 and 18. So all these things have been happening over years. Dowry Prohibition Act, which, were, which is an old act, is a good act because it does not only criminalize taking and uh, giving and taking a dowry. It also criminalizes uh, demanding dowry. So even without taking or giving, a person can be made to be on the defensive and duly so legally. So there are instruments available. We need to be well equipped, well trained, well geared to engage with them and uh, to make the best use of them to accelerate the pace of, uh, of transformation of our mindsets and behavioral patterns and cultural norms. Sometimes it does so feel that we've fallen sick to a certain extent. We don't need to be sick. We need to be healthy as a society. 
and in a social kind of a mindset. So I think we can keep on speaking, but uh, for the time being, difference. Thank, Thank you so you much. Uh, Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, for two minutes, if you, uh, the panel allows me, Mahatma Gandhi's granddaughter is here, and I'll take these two minutes to just, you know, We'd like to acknowledge the presence of Mrs. Tara Gandhi Bhattacharya. She is uh, a very well-known face. She's been very instrumental in taking the legacy of her grandfather forward and promoting. It was not actually, uh, it was just an example which floated through my mind and I, you know. No, but that's a very relevant one. Yeah, it's a very relevant one, but you know what I was trying to actually point out was to establish the fact that it is the, actually the gender relations at play or it is the mindset which women, you know, when they gaze in the mirror or when they think about it, when they think about any situation, it's the emotional quotient of the women, one. And secondly, also the centuries old baggage which they carry that they feel responsible for every situation that happens at workplace, that happens at home. And, you know, yet they try to deliver, you know, as uh, you would agree, they try to give their 150% to every situation to make the things move the way the men would not have to or be expected to. Maybe in their own way, inside their hearts, they also think the same way, but this is how we women think. To prove ourselves in any dimension, I think we have to apply ourselves much more than men have to. Yeah, so uh, again, you know, talking in Indian context, because we were talking about the schemes, you know, uh, that seek to protect them or to, that seek to promote them. Most ministers make mention of women empowerment in their discourses from time to time. To that extent, gender consciousness is growing in India. Recent legislations have lent support to the cause and voice of the women. On the whole, gender consciousness is on an increase. I would agree on that. And also, so my question to Justice uh, Mr. Chandrachur, sir, you have authored such path-breaking judgments. What does gender equality mean to you? What are the areas that need urgent attention? How can judiciary be helpful in this more effectively? I'm not going to talk about my own judgments because I think judgments uh, are done when a judge signs them, and then it's for everybody else to criticize them and critique them. Uh, but there's something which I want to really uh, say at the outset, and. Uh, uh, which is that every day that I uh, hear cases in the Supreme Court uh, and you hear cases involving crimes against women in the domestic context, uh, crimes arising out of dowry, uh, uh, death by hanging, uh, suicides by women, uh, you always find that there's not just a man but a woman who is implicated in the crime. Uh, which is really a very sobering reflection on the, uh, the, the state of society. Uh, and this is also a reminder to us that whether it's the woman as a victim or perhaps even the woman as a violator of the rights of other women, they are both a product in different perspectives, of course, but they are both a product of a very highly patriarchal set of uh, social values. Because how is it that a woman who is, say, uh, a mother-in-law at the age of 50 or 55 <coughs> turns a violator 30 years down the line when perhaps she has faced uh, the kind of discrimination which you find the daughter-in-law facing in the crimes against women. And this I find repeatedly in case after case after case that women as victims, women as violators, are all part of this social conditioning, uh, a social system 
a system of very highly male dominated patriarchal and feudal setups uh, in which women are viewed really uh, as uh, in a very in a very different way uh, there are three areas of gender equality which i want to <coughs> emphasize first the rights of women in the domestic sphere because that is where i think the core of the work on equality uh, remains to be done as we know in india reproductive decisions are sometimes taken collectively as a family the choice as to whether or not to have a child whether to continue to uh, with the pregnancy or not uh, these are decisions which are not taken by the woman herself uh, which deprives her of her sexual agency and this has a very disparate impact on not merely the health of the woman but on the professional development of women uh, when does a girl get married when does a woman get married uh, whom does she get married to these are all critical decisions on child rearing the traditional belief is that this is the domain and the obligation of women which needs to be questioned something which vinita mentioned a short while ago so measures such as the extension of paternity leave for for men in the workplace uh, uh these are measures which really must challenge the prevalent mindsets of uh, what is regarded as the proper role for women and the proper role for women so to speak in the domestic environment the second area i think is you need to focus on the rights of women in the in the labor market because the patriarchal labor society is also premised on a certain degree of male nervousness against women that the excellence of women which really would uh, perhaps lead to the exclusion of men from uh, a very tight job market now that is the core reason why women are being excluded are excluded from managerial positions and from equal pay for equal work which is essentially essentially recognized as a fundamental constitutional precept now both are inherently connected to equal worth and a sense of dignity for women which cannot be divorced from a market economy so there has to be positive protection in the labor market and it is wrong there must be an assessment that it is wrong to frame paternalistic policies will you not recruit a woman because she is as it were in a child in a child bearing age work environments must be premised on choice the choice for a woman to leave early not to be compelled to leave early from the workplace the choice to have or not to have menstrual leave now these are essential key elements of uh, reframing labor policies which i think we need to talk about and the third area which i want to focus upon is not just to focus on women but to focus on the rights of gender minorities the transgender community for instance faces social <coughs> exclusion and as a result of which the transgenders are uh, mired in poverty in india so the dialogue on gender equality cannot end with a he for she hashtag and must include all gender identities so that the right of <laughs> the right of gender minorities to freely occupy public spaces to occupy schools colleges theaters without the fear of ostracization this is a very crucial uh, element of our dialogue absolutely thank you justice chandra too um, i i do recall your judgment even though you had said that uh, you know it is not the time to discuss that but you know we've all um, yeah we are all aware of it so i'm not going to mention it here and uh, taking it uh, forward to his excellency uh yugo astuto uh so you have uh, a distinction of staying uh, living in so many uh, different countries and um, uh, different cultural environments say europe and asia also nairobi i read in your profile so uh, how and what would your uh, message be that where is this movement um, there is this movement going what is the future of the movement and what kind of impact do you anticipate this movement can make in uh, different cultural and uh, context and in different continents i'm not sure 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam. Yeah, well, yes, indeed. I have had the privilege of living in, in very different cultural contexts. So there are certainly are differences. But I think what, what, what is of importance here is, is that um, um, there are universal values uh, which are common to mankind, universal values of uh, human dignity, freedom, equality, and solidarity. And I think that among these universal values, the point of equality, gender equality, the need to ensure equality of opportunity to men and women is certainly key, irrespective of the, of the cultural context. That is, that is very true, sir. Uh, so, despite, uh, so can I uh, ask for a mic? Thank you, sir. I would like to re read from the report. Uh, Justice Chandrachur also just now mentioned, so I would like to re read a few sentences from the report itself. <coughs> there is no country where men spend the same amount of time on unpaid work as women, cites the World Economic Forum Global Gender Gap Report 2020. Here's another from the same report. In the past 50 years, 85 states have had no female head of state. That is the state of matters despite gender diversity having been in focus for the last four to five decades. My question to this distinguished panel, I would like to ask everybody that we all know that political participation of women is one of the key solutions, uh, you know, uh, bringing more women on the, in the leadership roles. We often keep talking about that. Yet, it seems like, I don't want to leave the panel on a pes pessimistic uh, note and say this is something which looks achievable in 2075 or, you know, there is talk of this uh, artificial intelligence or the coding being done by robotics which are all created by males and so you know the target goes farther and farther and becomes more difficult and more complicated but just to have a more focused discussion on say about you know next five years or next ten years we all agree that gender consciousness is on the rise. Women have become more assertive and things are happening, changes are happening for the better. Uh, governments are acknowledging this. Women themselves are becoming more conscious. <laughs> so what, according to you, would be two major points, Dr. Evans, which you would like to give as a message to all women and men that they should follow in their behavior and practice which would bring about ready change and more quickly and more measurably. Okay. Um, yeah. um, <clears throat> very quickly, the two things that I would like to see change in terms of the interpersonal relationships of, of men and women. First of all, for everybody, both parties in, a, in, a, in, a, in an intimate relationship, in, in, in a, in a relationship which involves just two people, to, think, to be asked to think about, to be taught to think about, um, as we heard um, suggested, um, should be part of the education of children. <coughs> To what extent am I asking this person to do X or Y because I feel I am more powerful than they are? Think about power, first of all, because I think power is absolutely key to questions of gender. So that's thing number one. And think about it through education. Think about where it comes from. Think about what its implications are. And think about what we as individuals do with it. I mean, when we've, we've, we've heard about women being involved in appalling cases of dowry deaths, etc., etc., but the problem is that very often those people who are in positions of weakness will bully others. And we have to think about what makes people feel weak and makes weak people become bullies. So those kinds of questions about how power operates in an intimate space as well as in more social spaces I think have to be addressed. That's point number one. The second thing, I think, is to recognize that empowerment should be a collective situation for women and not one which is focused on individual achievements. Individual achievements are great. Let's have more of them. Let everybody think of that as part of their 
of what they aspire to. But let us also think collectively that how do we empower, how do we assist those millions of women who, help, who barely have access to literacy, barely have access to secondary education. Empowerment is not just about being a leader, about being individually successful, it's also about taking part in collective movement. Thank you. I really don't have much to add, but yes, uh, if you are talking of two things, then two, the first I would want to uh, point, bullet point would be respect for rights and dignity and uh, right for safety, especially in, in all kinds of spaces, personal, domestic, public, workplace, all spaces, mind spaces, you know, so including emotional violence, things like that. So respect for rights, dignity, safety, peace of others, especially you know, when we're talking of women, yes, definitely of women. Uh, second, uh, also quite in uh, online of uh, what Professor Evans uh, said, uh, collective consciousness, we all share a collective consciousness. So we must remember if we kind of displace somebody from that person's uh, right of place, right of uh, any kind of you know rightful presence, then we are doing some counter harm to ourselves also. We must remember this. And uh, if we do, I think whether we are male, female, or somebody else, we will be able to do better on this uh, agenda. Thank you. violence, this invisible violence which we knowingly and unknowingly inflict upon the gender spectrum, the disrespect which is so evident and you know a very, very significantly large number of population across the world needs to be sensitized on this. So His Excellency, would you like to add something to this? Well, I'd simply recall that indeed there is much we, we need to do. We need much to do under the, the, the economic dimension, and, and as it has been said earlier, the, the very principle of equal pay for, for equal uh, uh, work is enshrined in the legislation of most countries uh, around the world, but it still has to be translated into practice. And then the political empowerment, well, as you, as you recalled earlier, in, in, in parliaments around the world, the, 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 the number of women is, is certainly inferior to the, to the number of women in terms of population. Justice what would you like to add to this kindly request? Well, I'll make very three very uh, brief points on this. Um, I think the first uh, major change that is sweeping our society today is uh, the spread of women's education. And I think, uh, uh, let me share a very personal uh, experience. I have interns and law clerks who work with me uh, from durations of three months to uh, two years. And the one major factor which is uh, sweeping change across India uh, is the development of education for women. And these are not just very highly urbanized women who are coming into the uh, marketplace of ideas and the, uh, the marketplace for labor and services, uh, but women coming from all different parts of the country. And I think the one major change which is uh, now taking place is the assertion of the rights of women by women themselves as a result of uh, robust patterns of uh, education. Uh, the second which I want to really emphasize that if we need to carry this movement further, you must look upon men not as having to play a star role, uh, so to speak, but men as being responsible allies in this, uh, in this uh, foundation for creating equality, uh, equality for women. And the third, that it's also important for us to begin at the top, just as we are looking at the mainstream of society, to make our public institutions more inclusive, have more women into responsible positions of governance, whether it be in the courts, whether it be in the parliament, whether it be in government. Uh, I think across the spectrum, 
whether it be in the corporate sector, whether it be in the law firms. Uh, so it's important that we have a greater sense of uh, inclusion uh, for women. Because ultimately, if something has to work in breaking these stereotypes that, you know, presume that, well, women are emotional, men are the breadwinners, women are weak, men are the people who lead from the front. If you have to break these uh, stereotypes, the only way you can do that is by the example of women who are breaking those stereotypes and creating examples for themselves as role models for the rest of society. I think we need to open the floor to Q&A because I can see so many hands raised and I, 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 I just I, have to make an two interjections. Okay, all right. And because we have an international panel here. Uh, we have not spoken about technology and women. We have already spoken in the first okay. panel. Okay, so all right. So I, I think I was at work. I have uh, brought this out even to Tata Memorial Hospital. The medical equipment in hospitals is not friendly to the woman's anatomy. Yeah, all experiments. And no, I spoke to the head of Tata Memorial. He says, I took a group of journalists there, uh, this um, Department of Atomic Energy, and they showed us all these nuclear machines. He says, they're all, all the machines are made in America. In the US, we only import them. A case in point is the mammography, mammography machine. But this might which, not be the right panel for this question. No, I but people are from here, technology and women, men don't go through mammography tests. People don't know how painful it is for women over the age of 40 to go into those machines. If you can take it forward, to whichever level in your countries, it would be wonderful. You must have, ex everybody's experienced it and nobody talks about it. Second point I want to mention is His Holiness Dalai Lama has started an experiment with the Emory University in America, which has gone quite ahead, that all our academic experiences are for nurturing the brain, the mind, intellect, there is no curriculum or academic area to teach the heart and the emotions. How do you deal with emotions? And he started this curriculum in different schools, selective schools in Europe, Germany, France, America, where children from the age of, you know, kindergarten and above learn emotional education. So that's what I wanted to do. I think, sure. I think it's a very, very important point. I think, um, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> even for gender sensitization, I think I have it written in my, even in my, in my notes, you know, the uh, affirmative action steps that can be promoted socially at schools, tertiary institutions, and in the workplace to propagate, you know, uh, at a very, um, what do you call it, soul level or spiritual level or a level of the emotions, I think in the long term, I think the long term achievement would be that only how we change the way, uh, you know, we can't, uh, I don't know how to uh, articulate myself in words. What I'm trying to say is uh, sensitization would be a soul change, you know, the kind of, uh, it is so ingrained in us so ingrained in men and women both, it has taken uh, millions of years. So, but, you know, the our expectation that it vanishes overnight or something is unrealistic maybe, but it is, we have to tread on the path and we have to make things happen and how fast we can make them happen would be a great achievement for men and women both. Uh, I would ask, uh, uh, my distinguished man, and if somebody would like to add on this, or from the audience, if somebody would like no, to. No, she wants to ask. No, let her finish. Yeah, I have, I have. Yes. Uh, I would, um, uh, if there are any questions that. Uh, my question here yeah. is yeah. that we, we would, uh, why can't we start uh, getting the parents to realize that boys and girls are equal? <coughs> 
children only learn from what they see, isn't it? If the mother and father are treating the boy and girl the same way, rather if the mother and father are sharing the work, which I think in Indian households doesn't happen. Maybe it does happen in the West a little bit. Maybe with the younger parents, maybe it's beginning to happen. But that is where the beginning should happen, where the men share the work. See, what happens is that the lady has to run the house, has to bring up the kids. If there's no maid, she cannot go to work. So another thing for the government to take note of is we should have skill development for nannies, for people who can look after for ayahs, but better qualified ayahs who can look after the kids, who are able to read to the children. So that is something which would help when the children grow up. They know that it's equal. Father is doing as much work as the mother is doing. But this doesn't happen in Indian households. I don't know what happens in the West. I know it's a little bit. Children are today's yeah. children are tomorrow's parents. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes but I'm today's parents. Don't you think we need skill everything. development for Indian men? Yes. Or how to look after their children, yes. not for ayahs or nannies, but for the Indian panel. men. Yeah. That would be so completely for certain. For anybody in the panel, any question 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 People uh, take shortcuts. They give gadgets to their children. Ma'am, just uh, people give uh, gadgets to the children. Take a mic and get a mic. Can you have the mic? Thank you. So, in this uh, fast paced life today, parents don't have time for the children. I mean, the uh, uh, wife so is having. Any specific question you have to anybody in the panel? Please, if you have a question, no it's a question, ma'am. Yeah. It's not an observation, it's a okay. question. Let me just uh, get to it. Yeah. It's okay. Anybody can answer that, but it's just a question I want to put across. I just, the bike is coming at a different Everything time. Everything need not be a question, you know. Observations are equally valuable, I would say, because uh, through observations, we are we get the ability to think more. Okay. Do, you know? All right. So, to have a child. If one is not really having the resource bandwidth and the time bandwidth to really bring up the child, take to look after the child personally and to groom the child personally. So, yeah, you're right. But the caveat there, I would say, would be that both parents need to be, you know, together in this decision because uh, as the times move, the responsibility should be for both the parents to equally participate in taking care and grooming the child up. Taking care of and grooming the child up. So that definitely should be there. And Bob, it's a very good suggestion that there should be male nannies also trained. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if we can have a, have a better word for male nannies. You know, one thing which I want to add on this, which is what ma'am said, that I think uh, gender sensitization of men has to start from our schools. Because, uh, and homes, because young children, young children when they go to school, uh, one thing which we don't tell, one, one thing which we don't teach children when they are very young, particularly the young men, is the importance of, you know, making your own food, carrying your own plate to the kitchen, for helping your mother when she is, you know, undergoing her period, uh, all kinds of things like that. So I think it's crucial that schools start this. You know, across the board, I've seen this in Mumbai, for instance. I originally belonged to Mumbai, but you know, I, I went to Allahabad. I worked in Allahabad as Chief Justice for several years. Now, of course, I'm here. One thing which schools don't really, if, if you look at the school curricula, it's always the mother. Mothers have to come to school. Mothers will take the child by carpool. It's never the father. It's never the parent. Even the circulars which most schools today send are always couch are always couched in, uh, in, in in gender insensitive terms. So it's presumed that well the mother will be doing this. Why? So I think it's very very important when we are talking of changing the uh, mindset that we change the mindsets of the schools as well and uh, ensure that this element of sensitization begins when 
young boys at two and three and four and five years old, that's when you have to teach them the right values. Yes, absolutely. Something about the gender equality business. See, I've spent decades growing up, and I must say, I've watched this instinct of women changing over the years. We were born with maternal instincts, which we are losing. You know, in a home, many years ago, the girl used to feel uh, maternal towards her younger siblings and would look after when the mother was sick. Now, there was nothing wrong or questionable about it. But today, when a girl is said, look after your brother if he's not well, now she'll rebel. She'll say, I'm a woman. You can't do that to me. You're torturing me. Why should I be the only one to look after this? <laughs> that you're killing the maternal instinct of a, of a child. I'll tell you an example. I was 30 years old. I was going to the university. I was a professor. I was retired. And this rickshaw puller told me, oh, ma'am, you look like my mother. I never said anything to him. I said, really? I'm so happy I look like your mother. In what way? He said, because you're talking so gently. Then, when I was 50 years old, this petrol pump where I fill my car with petrol, he says, Daddy, grandmother, oh, I've seen you over the years. Why, where did you disappear in the last two years? Other women go take a front. How dare he call me a grandmother? And how dare that man call me a, call me a mother? You know, I think women should really cultivate that maternal instinct and that love. I think we are killing love. We are forgetting to smile. The men are forgetting to smile. The women are forgetting to smile. There is no sense of humor in society. And I feel so shocked. Because I am full of sense of humor. I can laugh at myself. But nobody can laugh at themselves any longer. I'm 70 years old and I feel so sick when young people say, you know that boy said this to me. I said, why did you say you're so handsome too? If you say that, you just will say you're also handsome. Is there anything wrong? I mean, why don't they say that sense of humor? Please, <laughs> allow girls to continue sense of humor. <laughs> no, this is not a light note, ma'am. One second. Ma'am, so much. You said so well. Uh, we must all flourish into being what we are. Yeah, so there's nothing wrong about it. It's about elbowing somebody out of that person's space, which we are talking. I think that is what the intention is. We don't want to elbow, elbow somebody out of one's own space just to have more space for myself. Mantra, am I annoying you? Sorry. Just five minutes. I'm okay. Yeah. So when Justice Chandrachur says that constitution, uh, in its very nature, is feminine, he gives us hope. Thank you very much. And uh, when you mentioned paternity leave, so interesting part is that if there is any survey done on paternity leave of men, 80% of them would be on Netflix. So, <laughs> but, on a serious note, Mr. Nivasa, you mentioned two keywords. One, you felt offended, when obviously people ogle at our dear ones and women. Offended is the word. And second, you mentioned instruments to deal with and baby bachao as a slogan. How offended did you feel when you read in papers that 60 girls, they, they were made to remove their clothes to check yeah. whether they were menstruating yes. or not? Yes. And yes. worse, a seer after that goes about saying something like that uh, a man who eats uh, from, you know, cooked food of a menstruating woman, uh, you know, she'll be a dog and he'll be some other animal. Yeah. So, uh, how many centuries of trickle down of development and gender sensitization we are talking about, and how do you structure it in your government program? Yeah, that's a difficult question, but uh, yeah, the question is very crystallized, definitely. Thank you so much. And uh, it's good to be able to crystallize the ideas into sentences because then one can approach them better. Uh, sorry about this philosophy, but uh, how many centuries? We hope it's not centuries. Uh, we hope it's not even decades and we are able to be faster as a society because the government can uh, definitely play a role but beyond that it really is uh, the collective movement of uh, people together uh, we are whether we are in the government or we are somewhere else outside the government we are all together on this land to you know 
have a better life put together for ourselves. So if we realize that, if we be prepared to do something about it, and if we know what to do about it, then I'm sure we'll be able to be better and be better for ourselves, put together for our sisters, for our daughters, for our wives, and for the women we know or don't know. Uh, I really don't know how to answer your question fully, but yeah, I do get the import of your question that we should be better and faster about it in the government and uh, with the government or without the government, all the ways. <laughs> yeah. So, I have a question. Uh, I work with the education sector, so I'm a clinical psychologist. When we are talking about educating the youth, my question to you is in this instant gratification phase, how do you integrate all the stakeholders, the teachers, parents, the counselor, and the students, and come up with proper integrated policy so that you're able to educate the mindset and bring about reforms? Who was your question addressed It's open to, to the panel. Uh, if I may also just add to that about the, you know, it needs to be included in the curriculum. You know, you need to, and especially in government schools, rural areas, put it into the curriculum, and that is most important. And the other point that I just want to make a suggestion, uh, unpaid care workers, you know, in the home, outside, everywhere, uh, is mainly, you know, as you are aware, is, is, is the domain of women. And if this, and even the housework, if this can be given an economic, uh, you know, structure, an economic amount, and be added to the GDP. I mean, I mean, these suggestions have been coming over the years, but nobody is doing anything about it. So whether we can find a practical way of including it as part of our GDP and giving a, an economic value to that unpaid work, that is the day empowerment will begin. The first I think step. we always add it to the GDP at the end of it because uh, care is what really uh, nurtures people into becoming what they are. And if uh, they become more productive in life over a period of time, then that is how they contribute better to the economy. If women are not, uh, if the care, care work, the care responsibility, and all the care-related inputs which we all benefit and have benefited over our lives from, uh, from women, actually yes, women. So. Uh, if you really count them, if, if I am con contributing something to the economy today, it's because my mother cared for me and she didn't charge me or anybody else for that. So uh, how, to really, uh, how to really quantify into rupees the care work so as to add to the trillions of dollars we want to talk, we want to, tell, we want to take our economy to five trillion dollars in yeah. a few years. Yeah. So, Suppose we add the care, care responsibility, you know, the care economy part of it to it, probably we'll achieve it faster. But you're saying we, uh, you're saying we keep talking about it, and we really don't end up Quantify. doing anything concrete to count it. Yeah. Uh, you're working with the Delhi University. No, I would really want to be able to, you know, interact with yeah. some of the real really, you know, accomplished experts, including Madam Eve himself, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> you know, so as to be able to quantify the care economy into uh, the contribution it can make into the annual GDP of a country. Yes, because if you hire a person, you will pay that person. We may not pay your mother or something, but you can at least quantify it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, so that's there. But uh, then how do we, uh, uh, how do we really say that this much the, uh, these many dollars have got added to the GDP. There. That's uh, economic, I think economists yeah. need to look at that and see how to work it Yeah, some good, really, quantified. really, yeah. really good economists <laughs> <laughs> need to do this. <laughs> and so maybe. Let me just uh, respond to uh, ma'am your question and your, your comment, uh, which is I think the real problem with our, uh, and, and that's really perhaps taking it to a different, uh, to, to a different topic for discussion, but I'll just sort of, uh, just touch upon it, is that there is something fundamentally wrong with the way we are imparting education to our children. Because um, the way we impart education is to basically uh, provide more information, and just information, and more information uh, to the young. That's not the purpose of education. 
I think we need to realize that, you know, by diluting the amount of math that we are teaching our children, or the diluting the amount of grammar which we are teaching our children, or, or science that we are teaching our children, you gain much more by reducing our emphasis on the <coughs> rote learning which we impart to children, and really try and make them better human beings. Uh, I think there is nothing as critical to uh, good citizenship as having uh, citizens who are tolerant, citizens who are accepting of the rights of others, citizens who respect others on a footing of equality, irrespective of race, caste, religion, language, culture. And that we can only do by fostering education as a means of uh, providing for genuinely sensitive young minds. <coughs> Which means that we have to revamp our uh, revamp our educational system by creating more open structures for allowing young people to think. So I think that is crucial, and it's not just enough that we keep on providing more and more and more and more learning to individuals. Yeah, maybe we are going to we are going to produce a set of geeks for the future. We really need to create more good citizens for the uh, for the future. And so far as unpaid work is concerned, you know there are examples. For instance, in the context of the motor accidents claims, when uh, an accident takes place, and the person who is involved in an accident, perhaps uh, somebody who has died or disabled, uh, is a homemaker. How do you assess her loss of income for the future? So our courts have now really laid down that look, even if the person who was involved in an accident was a homemaker who does not have income in the conventional sense, you don't have a salary slip where the uh, income earner is earning say 50,000 rupees a month, yet unpaid home work, it has an economic value. And we have really started, we have, of course that's taken place several years ago, that we are assessing the contribution of homemakers to the uh, workplace, uh, to the wider economy. And I think these concepts need to really be uh, to to, emphas to be emphasized, so as to bring a, a real sense of self worth to women. Also, my mother never went to work, and I do believe. I mean, she's 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 no longer with us for the last decade and more. I always felt that she had this thing at the back of her mind that she was not contributing to the income generation of the family. But I think yes. But I think. Uh, the more important part was that, look, the contribution which she made is something which she never understood in terms of just the economy, the economics of it all. Uh, we were too young to really tell her that. But now looking back on life, you know, you have happinesses, you have regrets. And I think that's one critical thing which that must be happening to millions of women across the uh, spectrum in India, uh, which needs to be acknowledged. Uh, when women are playing the role of uh, homemakers. that needs to be there with everybody is that how their body function and how the emotion function according to their body and how their mindset function because these three are completely integrated with each other like if your mind is thinking something else and your body is doing something else and your emotions are working completely different and this is what is happening these days because everybody is speaking something but they are feeling something completely different so how we should actually implement that from the core age till the end age because we have to like the complete society has to bring that change otherwise the change won't happen because I we can your question is pretty much the same with justice chandrachu just answered and the entire i think panel has also <coughs> yes, agreeing course. on that that the change has to come and that change has to begin from home and also has to be taken forward from school the mindset how it is created, the values, how they are imparted in different cultural contexts. The, the, those values have, have to be more encompassing, they have to be more gender sensitive, and they have to be emotionally balanced so that the, the kind of the child that the society raised, whether it is in the United States of America or Europe or India or Africa, anywhere, 
the children, the the you know the about the future generations, they are more gender sensitive. Thank so you very much. This is why we need to make a course which should be available for all, everybody the, the, to do it. Yeah, you know, you can't make a single curriculum available to the entire world. I think because cultural <coughs> contexts are so different. And, they are, uh, I, and I, I should appreciate and admire that. And I think that, of course, uh, you know, some things, some common things and some things which are particular to that culture and that geographical region or that, uh, uh, you know, maybe, let's see. Uh, I would uh, invite one last comment, uh, if there is anything that yes. anybody yeah. from panel yeah. wants to add, and uh, can we, uh, yeah. uh, I can see a lot of but questions, and Padra is all ready to come up on stage, and I can't keep my uh, star artists waiting, and uh, you know, there is dinner for you all, and we can't delay that anymore. And on this note, I thank this extremely distinguished panel, and Started from the school, ma'am teaches. Thank you, everybody, for your valuable time. And more than anybody, thank you, all of you, for being such wonderful audience and asking such stimulating questions. Thank you.